Thank you for joining Toastmasters International's 2020 virtual convention. The session will begin in five minutes. Thank you for joining Toastmasters International's 2020 virtual convention. The session will begin in three minutes. Thank you for joining Toastmasters International's 2020 Virtual Convention. The session will begin in one minute.
Toastmasters and guests, it is my pleasure to welcome International Director of Region 2, Distinguished Toastmaster, Joan T. Lewis. Hello to everyone joining us online and from around the world. Welcome to the 2020 Accredited Speaker Program. The Toastmasters International Accredited Speaker Program is designed for members who combine subject mastery with professional speaking skills and have reached a level of proficiency that enables them to be a paid professional speaker. Since 1981, the accredited speaker program has recognized 87 individual Toastmasters with this prestigious designation. To recognize those who have achieved this designation, we have provided a link below to a full list of these accredited speakers. Please visit the accredited speaker page on the Toastmasters website to learn more. The journey to become an accredited speaker takes years of planning and training. In January, the application process for level one opens to all eligible members. Candidates submit an application and a video recording of a presentation performed in front of a live audience. Applications and recordings are evaluated by a panel of experienced judges and are scored using an official judge's guide and ballot. Those who meet the judging criteria advance to level two, which means they are invited to speak before you, an audience of Toastmasters, guests, members, and judges. This year, we have four accredited speaker candidates. In the midst of the coronavirus COVID-19 pandemic, the candidates who are speaking today demonstrated adaptability to our changing global landscape in their willingness to present as professional speakers for an online audience. In today's marketplace, it is increasingly critical that professional speakers are able to effectively address an online audience. All candidates who pass today will receive the prestigious accredited speaker designation. The candidates who will present for us today are Forrest Tuff from Tucker, Georgia, United States. Dr. Kevin Snyder from Raleigh, North Carolina, United States. Muhammad Ali Shukri from Manama, Kingdom of Bahrain, and Otis Tobias from Arusha, Tanzania. Each candidate has the opportunity to present on a topic they would typically give to their clients, not a Toastmasters audience. Each presentation will be evaluated by a panel of anonymous judges and scored on content, delivery, and language. The results of today's program will be announced during the World Championship of Public Speaking, streaming tomorrow at 2 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. The World Championship of Public Speaking will be streamed via the Toastmasters Virtual Convention, and we welcome all of you to join us. Prepare to discover how you can begin to pursue your passion to work in the film industry. Forrest Tuck is the founder and CEO of One Vision Productions, an award-winning multimedia production company that has worked on documentaries, independent films, and a major motion picture with 20th Century Fox. As a speaker and certified business mentor, he has empowered thousands across the globe to maximize their potential by taking initiative toward their goals. He wants to encourage each of you to do the same. Forrest is dedicated to help individuals overcome their fears while inspiring them to live courageously. Today, you will learn three actionable tips to help you break into the film industry. Please welcome Forrest Tuff as he presents, Run to Your Dreams. Thank you, International Director Lewis, for that introduction. I'd like to start by saying, while that is my face on that poster, that is not my body. You see, I too 
am running to my dreams. Hashtag fitness goals. <laughs> How many of you are ready to face your fear, face those insecurities, and take a chance on you to pursue your passions? And yes, it may be hard. You have to be dedicated. You have to have focus, and you may have to make sacrifices. And if you're fortunate, you'll have others to help support you on the way. Some of you here want to be actors. You want to be filmmakers. You may want to be the next Steven Spielberg or Tyler Perry. You simply may just want to work on a film set. If that's you, you're in the right place. Today, we'll take the first step to run to your dreams. Let's talk about dreams. This was my first love. I knew that I was going to be an NBA basketball player. I had the shot. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. I used to have games where I would hit 11 three-pointers, 10 three-pointers, 30 points in one half. And from a child to an adult, I made it all the way to Division I college. That is the highest level of college basketball. One more goal, and I would have been a professional basketball player looking at millions of dollars and the ability to take care of my family. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. I severed the nerves in my finger, and just like that, my career was over. I could no longer play the sport. So I was tasked with this question. What's next? You see, I was lost. I had no direction and I did know where to go. You see, I made the mistake of having tunnel vision. Much like a radiologist, I don't think they have a second profession. So as a professional basketball player, neither did I. But in the summer of 1996, I had to make a decision. And as a man, it was time to move out of the house. So I decided it was time to go spread my wings and make my mark on this world. So I told my mother and father, it's time for me to go. I need to make my mark on planet Earth. Now my father, he's a man of few words, and he's about 6'4". He looked at me and he put his hand on my shoulder. He said, son, I'm proud of you. Now go. Now the truth is, had I not decided to go, he probably would have kicked me out anyway. I was too big. There was too many people eating in the house. Now my mother, different story. She was about five feet. She was a little spitfire from Atlanta, Georgia, and she loved me. You see, I was her baby. And she told me, son, when you go out into this world, I have three things that you need to know in her little Southern accent. Now, something else you should know about my mom. She loved Toastmasters. She loved acronyms. And she never passed up a good joke. She looked at me. She said, baby, don't you ever forget this when you go in this world. One, research whatever you want to do in life. Two, understand what you're trying to do. And three, network with the people that will get you there. <laughs> I said, thank you, mother. Is there anything else? Because see, my mother had just imparted knowledge. She had given me the key to life itself. So I felt I was ready. But as I told you, my mother never passed up an opportunity for a joke. She looked at my dad, and she looked at me trying to hold her laughter, and she said, yes, run, Forrest, run! <laughs> and they burst out into thunderous laughter. You see, for those that don't know, Forrest Gump was a movie that came out in the 90s, and it was so popular, it had gone viral before there was social media. The character Forrest Gump had a name very similar to mine, Forrest Tough. So you could imagine, Everyone that I met relished the opportunity to say, run, Forrest, run. However, I had for them, so I thought it was hilarious. Little did I know that those words would come to guide me as I went on my, on my journey. And my journey was very difficult, because like I told you, I had no direction, no sense of what I wanted to do. But I persevered, and I did not quit, because I felt I was for great things. I was supposed to fly. But truthfully, I had to take baby steps. And eventually, I learned to run. It took some time, and a decade later, I started my business. 
I found something that I enjoyed doing and I could make money doing it. And I started my company, One Vision Productions. We service everything production company. Now I have the ability to make money and now I found myself getting involved in storytelling. I found myself passionate about storytelling and I decided I wanted to become a filmmaker. And now those same principles, research, understand and network are going to be used to help me get to that dream. And today I wanna to share that with you. So let's start with the first one, research. And I know you asked me, Forrest, I know what research is. Why do we need research to get into the film industry? I'm a great creator. I have a lot of artistry. So why do I need research? That is the great question. But the thing about research is that in order to get from point A to point B, you need to understand where you're going. You need to understand what it is that you're trying to do. So let's talk about some of the reasons you need research to get involved in the film industry. It's necessary to know your job role. Have you ever watched a film and at the end you see all these credits that last for about 10 minutes? Thousands of people. Well, guess what? Each of these individuals had a specific role and they knew as that role, as the cog in that machine, that's what made it work. And if you don't know that role, if you're that offset cog, you can destroy the entire process. So it's very important to do the research to know what you, where you fit. And also, a lack of knowledge will create fewer opportunities for you in this industry. A lot about the film industry is word of mouth. And individuals will refer you, but if you do not have the knowledge, they will also be able to tell that also. So let's talk about where you can go to get this information. Online is the perfect place. Online has a library of information on anything. It used to be that you couldn't find this information unless you went to the public library. But now you go online, you can go to Google. You can use your smartphone, your tablet, Siri. You can even ask Alexa if you don't feel like getting off the couch, Alexa, I'd like to know, how do I become a filmmaker? And Alexa will reply, in order to become a filmmaker, you must go here. There's no reason you cannot research now. And education, this is paramount to your success. There are film schools that are geared towards helping you in your specific area. There used to be a time where you could only go to New York or LA to learn about the film industry. Film schools are everywhere. They're popping up in all states now because this industry is huge. And they also have classes online. So learning how to get the information is paramount. And your resume. Because when you apply for a job, think about it. They want to know specifically what you can do for that position. I remember one time I applied for a job and I sent in my personal resume from my corporate days. <laughs> well, I never heard back, of course, because I told them about things that had nothing to do with the job. My volunteerism here with the Bank of America, it meant nothing. They needed a person that could record sound. So learn how to make a resume specific to this industry. If you're on a set and the director hollers out a term and you don't know it, that could get you kicked off the set. It is that serious in film. So for those of you who are aspiring to work in this business, learn the terminology in order to be effective on a set. You can become the go-to person and it can make you more valuable. This here is the place where you can find anything about any movie, any TV program, any internet show, IMDB. It is the resource where you can find out what director has worked on which project, how many awards have they won, what is the budget for this film? And this will be very important later on in our discussion. So what's the point of research? It provides a plethora of information as you're trying to get involved in this business. And it is the foundation from which you should start with the other processes. Now understand, what is understanding? To actually understand or perceive a thing. Because you've done all this research, but now if you don't understand it, what good is it? So how do you understand? How do you find a way to make sense of all this information that you've gotten? Action plan. Yes, 
This will help you to find out your failures or successes, your SWOT analysis, your strengths, your opportunities, your weaknesses, and the threats that could stop you from achieving your dream. This will be very integral in making sure that you can get to the finish line. And I love this university. I actually am working on trademarking it. It's called the University of Volunteer Services. And yes, I love to volunteer because it makes me feel good. It stops depression. It gives you a sense of purpose. But in this context, we're using volunteer service as a bartering agreement because you have to understand your service and time is money, and you have to use what you have to create opportunities for yourself. And one thing about volunteering that's really great in the film industry is you're actually learning the trade that you want to get involved in. So it is very important. Now, if you have a skill set, please utilize those to your advantage. The one thing that's great is there is industry film and there is independent film. In independent film, the budgets are zero to a thousand dollars. In the industry, millions of dollars. So here in independent, they need your skills. If you can provide a service, that is an A plus in the right direction. Understanding provides clear, concise direction. You'll know which way you're going and it saves you time from going down the wrong path. The final point that I'd like to make is networking. Networking is essential. It is the lifeblood of business. It is the business of people. And for me, networking is building relationships with like-minded people. It's not always what you know. It's also who you know. Because people have a tendency to know other things that you might not know. They know other areas that you may not be involved in. And if you take the time to get to know people, that can be the catalyst to realizing your dreams. And in this day and time, there are so many ways to do it. And let's talk about some of them. Social media. We now have LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. All of these services can provide you a way to interact with different individuals in your industry. And you know what? When you, when you network with someone, here are some suggestions. If they post, like it. Comment. That's the way they get to know you without having talked to you. You become an ally, a support base, someone who takes an interest in what they do. That is networking. When you take an interest in people, because people like people. And even if they don't like people, they'll like your comment. So remember, make sure that you use these platforms properly because they can allow you to continue networking with people. These sites here are global sites for filmmakers. So I don't care if you're in Georgia or India, you have the opportunity to network with like-minded professionals in your industry. Go to these sites, register, and meet people. Make it your business to know people, because guess what? You may meet somebody in Chicago, and they may get a job to film in Atlanta. Well, guess what? They might not know anyone else in Atlanta but you. Kudos. Just the other day, I met with someone at Toastmasters. Now, while that's not an amazing thing, they were in India. And I don't know if I would have done that had it not been for COVID-19. But right now, we have the, technolo the technological advances and the opportunities to meet people that we never would have had the opportunity to meet. Take advantage of it. So what is it about networking that's so important? It's the key to get your foot in the door. Networking with people is the opportunity that you might not have, but you need to take today. This picture is so synonymous for me because it's the catalyst of my introduction into the industry working with Fox Productions. You know about my history with basketball. And here's what I did. On IMDb, I found someone that was a director, a producer in the industry. And I cross-referenced them, and I found that they were working on an independent project with no budget or little budget. I understood my opportunity. 
So I contacted that person. We networked. We made friends. I came over and I offered a service that they needed. And it cost them a lot of money, but guess what? I had a product that they could use. But I had one stipulation for them. Treat me as if I am a paid staff member and a well-paid staff member. You see, I was working on the opportunity to be involved with a major motion picture. I didn't want to be treated with crumbs. I wanted to be treated as a professional. And we finished this project, award-winning project. This director looked great, and she moved on. And it just so happened, she received this job with 20th Century Fox. Yes, and they needed someone with my skill set. Who do you think she referred? Forrest. Yes, I know a Hall of Fame basketball player that can coach. Now, to be honest with you, I was hoping to get a job as a director, but, you know, baby steps, right? <laughs> so I go into this set, and I work with 20th Century Fox with all the actors for three months. I work with the producers, the directors. I work on set of the film. And three months, I made three times the amount of money that I didn't make here if I six months of working for free. My plan worked out. Remember, all of this is to get a return on your investment. Make sure you're in the business of doing things that have a purpose. For all of you out here today that are ready to get involved in film, I challenge you to believe in yourself and go. This is the time right now. It may be hard, it may be difficult, and you may experience bumps in the road, but stay on track and do not give up. And to all of you here, I normally would ask you to stand, but no, please, please stay seated. I know this is a virtual platform and you may have on your Zoom attire, <laughs> but I want to ask yourself this question. What am I passionate about? What does it take for me to pursue my passions? Now, right where you sit, I want you to say this. I will pursue my dreams. And I want you to remember these three points. Research is the foundation of where you're going. Understand where you're going and network with people that can get you there. And as my mother told me, run. Thank you. Please give our judges two minutes of silence to complete their ballots. Dr. Kevin Snyder 
is a recovering motivational speaker who has presented to over 1 million people and 1,000 audiences across the world. He is the author of several books, with two books becoming bestsellers and earning number one new release status on Amazon. Prior to speaking, Kevin worked in student affairs at several universities, most recently serving as Dean of Students for High Point University. He earned a doctorate degree in leadership and focused his research on self-efficacy. Kevin has sailed around the world, presented a TEDx talk, and next month will be attempting a Guinness World Record for the longest speech in history. Don't worry, it's a speech he will not be giving us today. Kevin's claim to fame, though, is that he lived his childhood dream of winning big on the television game show, The Price is Right. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kevin Snyder. Kevin, come on down. Have you ever had a dream that nobody believed in except you? Have you ever had a dream where someone told you you couldn't do something and you did it anyway? Well, folks, if so, you and I have a lot in common. For the past 20 years, I have been researching, studying, and writing about what drives human motivation, what drives people to be extremely successful. And in the next few moments, what I'm going to share with you are the top 100 leadership characteristics that make extraordinary leaders. Just kidding. We have a limited amount of time. I would not do that to you. But I will share with you what I believe is the number one determinant of where it all begins. If you look at these familiar faces on the screen, many of them have an unfamiliar story of success. Roger Bannister. He was the first person that broke the four-minute mile. And by doing so, he showed the world that it was possible, yet at a time where everyone thought he was crazy. And the story behind his story is that once he showed people it was possible, guess what happened? Others believed it as well. If we go to J.K. Rowling, many of you have heard her name because she is the best-selling author of the series of books titled Harry Potter, the number one series of books up until Fifty Shades of Grey. And that's a different program. Let's move on to Malala Yousafzai. Malala Yousafzai was shot in the head because she advocated for young girls to have the right to get an education. After recovering, she battled through that and received the Nobel Peace Prize. She is the youngest person in history to receive that prestigious award. Steve Jobs, many of you would know his name for being the founder of Apple. He is quoted by saying, the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. And just one more, we have Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King who said, not I have a goal, but I have a dream. So when we look at these individuals who literally have changed the paradigm and the world in which we live, let's ask ourselves a question about what drives their motivation? How was it that they were able to become so extremely successful? What is it about them that stands out? Think about that just for a moment. Reflect on what you believe is an amazing accomplishment of these extraordinary individuals. If we had more time, I'd encourage you to write this down, to share it in the chat, so that we can identify and discuss that success isn't just one, it doesn't just occur one way. 
In fact, success, depending on how we define success, depending what our goals are, we all define success differently and we achieve it in different ways. But what's most important is for us to realize what is the foundation of where it all starts? Ask yourself this question, who are other people that you know in your own life who've been successful? What are some of those qualities? Think about your greatest accomplishment in your life, something that you were very proud of. You're no different than these people up on the screen. You're no different whatsoever. So when we look at the common denominator of their success, one of the determinants and one of the qualities is that all these, those individuals were visionaries. And they were visionaries in the paradigm of, of a verb, not a noun. And the one word that I want us to be focusing on today is that they were dreamers. Repeat that with me, say dreamers. You sound good. Even Walt Disney said, it all begins first with a dream. It all begins first with a dream. That's where it all begins. And we can't live a dream unless we have one. We can't live a dream that we don't believe. This is why this is so important. It is the foundation for where it all begins. Yes, other qualities are extremely important. Taking action, persistence, getting a team around us, having a system to follow. But where does it all begin? It begins with where we, where we dream. Now, I am the proud daddy, first time daddy, of a young girl who, turned, who just turned one year old. I hope that I can judge my success as a father by how much she will dream. I want her to know that her dream is so extremely important that it will determine whether she makes change in her generation or becomes the victim of it. Now, you can possibly see that my wife, my beautiful wife, is expecting. We just found out, and it's hard to believe, that we're having baby number two. And by we, I mean my wife. <laughs> but with both of my children, what I want them to know is how important it is to not just dream, but to dream big. Because this, folks, it is not a course that they probably will take in school, unless it's a course taught by example from a great teacher. Many of us in the workplace, our organizations, our companies, we don't onboard our employees. We don't provide training about how important it is to dream unless that is done by a great supervisor or executive. So why is it that it's so rare for us to talk about dreaming when we know it's the number one determinant of where it all begins? Well, where does dreaming start? I looked this up on the internet so I know it's true. Dreaming begins with what we believe. And our beliefs come from how we think. You see, our minds are fertile soil. Our thoughts, our thoughts are seeds and what we plant will grow. Think about that. So if we want to change the fruit in our life, then it really begins at the root. But the reality is 73%, 73% of the average person's thoughts on a daily basis are negative. Are negative. Think about you, just have you ever had anybody would admit having some thoughts? Right, raise your hand if you've had a thought today. If you're having a few probably right now. Well, if you didn't raise your hand, check your pulse. See, I'm not surprised, 73% is also the same percent, the same percentage of employees who recently self-reported that they were unhappy to miserable in their daily job. Three out of four people would say if they could, they'd fire their own boss and find a new job. 73% of our thoughts are negative. 73% of employees feel negative about their work. Interesting. But there is something that we can do about it. There is something that we can understand better. 
And this negative reality inspired me to look into a term called positive psychology and a framework of that is called self-efficacy. Repeat that with me, say self-efficacy. Now, self-efficacy is quite simple. It is all about you or a person believing that they will achieve desired goals. So the higher levels of self-efficacy then would indicate that you have a higher level of belief that you can accomplish a desired goal. Whereas lower, a lower level of self-efficacy would correlate to the exact same thing, but in an opposite way. The lower level of self-efficacy would mean you have a lower belief that you will achieve desired goals. So in my research with students, who are the ones that you feel were the most successful with higher levels of self-efficacy or lower? Well, if you were thinking higher, you're exactly right. In fact, all the research participants in my study had 100% student retention. Think about the employees that I've surveyed. And from SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management Research, same exact thing. The people that felt empowered by their, by their employer, the people that had meaning to their work were the ones more likely to be successful and the ones more likely to stick around. So we are here in a moment today, right now, where we can plant a seed. We can plant a new seed that will create a new beginning. The reality though, is that we are virtual right now for a reason. We are virtual, we are in the midst of a global pandemic that has affected everyone in some way. Now, adversity is very difficult, yes? Well, guess what? So is success. And as we see here, just because the circumstances may not be ideal, just because the environment, yes, it has some challenges, it does not mean that we still cannot grow. And that, my friends, is where extraordinary leadership begins. So are you willing to plant a new seed with me today? Our time is short, but the potential that we have is not. It's endless. And there's a phrase, there's a song that, that I absolutely love. It's called, Don't Stop Believing." And if you've heard this song, I'm going to play it for you. If you've heard this song, then you know exactly it is one of the number one songs of all time. And just the phrase, Don't Stop Believing," makes me feel good. Here we go. <laughs> How do you feel? Feels pretty good, doesn't it? Right? So repeat with me. Say, don't stop believing. But believing in ourselves is the first step toward that dream. You see, my father, he inspired me to be a dreamer at a very young age. My dad had a dream to fly airplanes. My dad was a navigator in the United States Navy, and he lived that dream most of his life. My dad inspired me to have a, a dream when I was young, and my dream was playing soccer. Now, I wanted to be like Pele, the Brazilian soccer legend. Now, some of you are thinking, soccer? Wait a minute. It's not called soccer where I'm from, Kevin. Well, you're exactly right. It might be called football, or footballa, or gosh, Sipak bola or fadbold, right? <laughs> Point is, it's the sport where you kick the ball, right? Well, unfortunately, my dream came to an end because of a injury. And as I was laying in bed recovering from that injury, I discovered a new dream while, while watching television. My new dream was that I wanted to meet Bob Barker and be a contestant on the Price is Right. Now, perhaps you don't know about The Price is Right, depending on where you, did, where did you live. But envision a game show in your country that everyone loves, everyone wants to try to get on. So to my Price is Right fans out there, let me ask you a question, or think of your own favorite game show. 
Have you ever yelled at the television when someone makes a stupid bid? Probably. If you didn't raise your hand, you're probably not telling the truth. Well, folks, this was my dream to meet Bob Barker and be a contestant on The Price is Right. But I had no clue how. I just knew that I would. <laughs> so then the journey began. I arranged my high school schedule around The Price is Right. And if I couldn't watch the show, I would tape it every single night. When I went to college, I wrote a college paper. I did research. I wrote a paper on The Price is Right. The grade that I received was see me after class. I go see Dr. Adams after class. She holds up a copy of my paper in front of my face and says, Kevin, you have a problem. You're obsessed with this show, but this is one of the best papers in all my years of teaching that I've ever read. When Dr. Adams told me that I was really good at writing, guess what happened? I started to believe it too. Since then, I've published a few books because of Dr. Adams. So if you're looking for ways to motivate not just yourself, but also others, identify something they're really good at and tell them. Now, I watched The Price is Right throughout college. I arranged my college schedule around The Price is Right as well. And it came the day where I decided I'm not going to just have a goal. I want to take action. So I ordered tickets for the show. I received the tickets and realized it was the same date as my college graduation. So I had the opportunity to go out across the country from North Carolina out to Los Angeles or to go to my college graduation. I had a choice. What would you choose? Price is right, college graduation. Folks, I definitely chose the road trip. I chose the road trip. I went across the country. I drove 3,000 miles. And then the day that we showed up, guess what happened? The show was canceled. I was devastated. I fell to the ground, started crying like a little baby. I even got uh, escorted off property by security. But I had no choice. I couldn't just stop and stay there and wait. No, I had to return back home. And by the time I got back home, that internal voice inside my head reminded me how important it is to dream, not just once, but to keep dreaming over and over and over again. So I drove back out after six months, ordered my tickets, drove back out. Then we pull into the parking lot. It was open. And in fact, at 1 a.m. in the morning, there were people in front of me. Only one, but still. So I waited in line. For 10 hours later, we stood in line. And finally, they escorted us into the studio. Music started playing. And I could tell you what happened, or I could share with you a quick video that shows you exactly what occurred next. What would you prefer? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Okay, check this out. Here it comes from the Bob Parker Sydney Edison, Hollywood. <laughs> Actual retail price, sixteen twenty five. Kevin, my man, listen to what Rod has to tell you. Kevin, you have a chance to win $10,000 in cash. $10,000 on the punch board. My boy, you are there with $5,000. $5,000. $5,000 richer. You stop. He's going to quit right now. Well done. Thank you, Money Wise. How about that? <laughs> Folks, I didn't connect the dots until I got home. Apparently, the editor of the newspaper 
thought this was an amazing and inspirational story about a young boy having a dream and then pursuing it. Snyder lives dream on Price is Right. Our dreams are cyclical. If it wasn't for this dream, my dream of writing would not have occurred. My dream for speaking would never have occurred. Folks, at 12 years old, this was my dream. And it made sense to nobody else but me. But I dreamed it as if it was already happening in my life. It was just a matter of time. So you can't live a dream you don't believe. Now, in closing, you might think this presentation is about The Price is Right, about me, or a game show. No, it's not. Folks, this presentation is all about you. All about you asking yourself right now in this moment, do I have a dream? Did I have a dream? How would I motivate someone else to have that dream? So folks, our time is short, but the potential we have is endless. What is your dream? That's the message that will inspire you to achieve extraordinary results in your life. Please give our judges two minutes of silence to complete their ballots. Have you ever struggled to make your employees, team members, or the people you lead fully comply with safety behaviors, but to no avail? Mohammed Shukri will reveal a simple yet powerful formula that will turn your company's safety culture into one of the best. For more than a decade, Mohammed has helped organizations in the Middle East enhance their employees' safety compliance and safety culture through meaningful metrics and measurable motivation. His signature safety model has received accolades such as the best safety presenter in the Middle East. Today, Mohammed Shukri will share with you a model that he invented and implemented with great success. This model has proven to create safety compliance, a deeper commitment, and positive team environments. Whether you are a manager, supervisor, or team leader, Mohammed will drive you into his three-part model that will make you rethink safety culture. So fasten your seatbelts, 
Muhammad is going to take a shortcut, a safe shortcut. Please welcome health and safety expert and consultant, distinguished Toastmaster, Muhammad Ali Shukri, a safe shortcut to safety culture. Thank you, International Director Lewis. Yes, we are finally here. This is the address. But wait, what you're looking at is not a website address. It is a link though, a link and a formula to build and sustain a powerful and positive safety culture in your organizations. According to the International Labor Organization, there are more than 340 million occupational accidents every year. 2.3 men and women lose their lives to workplace accidents and illnesses every year. That means more than 6,000 people die due to work-related accidents and illnesses daily. And by the end of my presentation, I'm afraid that more than 80 people would have perished global-wide. This is all while companies and organizations all across the globe are doing their best. But unfortunately, the situation is only getting worse. Individuals and groups at work are still deviating from safety measures and standards. They are still taking shortcuts. Why? Because it makes them more productive, prompt, and profitable. They work less and gain more. But what if I told you today that we can have also this? Workers and management genuinely engaged in safety at all levels, values, perceptions, beliefs, attitudes, and of course, behavior. And by the way, these are the core components of safety culture. But the question remains, how to get from here to there, from unsafe shortcuts to safety culture? And the answer is a shortcut, a safe shortcut. The pictures you see at the bottom of this screen are from my previous company, where I used to work and I contributed to the well-being and safety of its workforce. And before I leave in 2009, I took with me a priceless model and method that I led and launched and spread to all those who needed to make their workplaces a better place. And today I am going to give you this model, a safe shortcut to safety culture. But way earlier, this is me joining Aluminium Bahrain Company, the largest aluminum smelter company in the Middle East. I worked in this power station as a turbine operator for 10 years. And as if the noise and the heat weren't enough, I had to put this on me and this on top. Why? Because the people up there want me to do so down here. When am I gonna be like them? In their position, it's so much more comfortable up there. I want to become in their position promoted. I waited 10 years until I got the promotion. I became a super visor. I now get to work less and gain more. The only problem was I was promoted to a safety supervisor, which means I need to put them again. Who cares? As long as I'm promoted to a supervisor, I get paid more and I work less. It doesn't matter. Too good to be true. I soon came to know that I got promoted because of something huge that happened. And my promotion was at a cost. 
on a hot Wednesday in 2003, Abdullah, a middle-aged worker and a father of seven, did not go back home to have lunch with his children. Instead, he died while he was performing his duties. A week later, Muhammad Rashid, a 24-year-old technician who worked with me in the power station, lost his life to an accident. Two Wednesdays were enough to be called the Black Wednesday. This Wednesday shook my company and shook my country. And soon I realized that my recruitment in the SHE department, safety, health, and environment, was part of a large and serious scale and scheme to make things better in Alba. So we soon joined the squad and in SHE department, myself, and with all management at all levels, we did all what it takes to bring things back to normal and make the place safe. And finally, in less than two years, safety was up and everybody was happy. The workers were happy, the management were happy, except she was not happy. The team at she department were up to data from very disturbing leading indicators. This data showed us that there are still things going wrong. Data that revealed to us that people are still not following procedures, not carrying out assigned duties properly and fail to comply with instructions. Although these things did not lead to accidents, yet there were clear signs, there were clear signs that people were still taking shortcuts. My colleague and I raised the proposal to the safety manager. The safety manager took it up to the uh, top management who approved of the program because it was part of the continual improvement in the company. And soon we launched a special behavioral improvement program in one of the departments called maintenance services as a pilot stage. And I was assigned to lead that program. So let me take you there in the department and show you how this was done. Ready? So the maintenance services department has eight sections. This is what I do in each section. An example is the fitting room. After closing the door behind, I am with the shop floor workers, no managers, no supervisors. It's only me and them. I break the ice. Hi, fellas. I have a question for you. What are the shortcuts that you do at work? Exactly, that was the answer, nothing. Mr. Muhammad, we don't do shortcuts. It's too risky. Okay, friends. Let me reassure you, nobody's here. I'm not writing the names down. Nobody will know your supervisors aren't here. It's just you and me. Slowly, they open up. The first person opens up. He says a shortcut. The other one gets encouraged. And by the, soon, I get a full list of the shortcuts that they do without knowing who does, who does what and when and where. So next question, fellas. What is the shortcut that you take more frequently than all the list? Mm, Mr. Muhammad, we probably take this shortcut more frequently. We don't wear safety glasses probably most of the time. Cool. So let's agree on that. Let's have that as our target. Next, I, I put up this information on the whiteboard and I tell, tell them, of course, this is the target behavior. Let's get better at wearing safety glasses. So tell me, why did you say that not wearing safety glasses are hazardous? Well, Mr. Muhammad, you know, there are fumes, there are uh, sm there is smoke, there are chemicals and flying objects coming in our eyes. Oh, great. Can I write them down? Yes, of course. And I write them down. Good. 
who is teaching me about the hazards? Is it me teaching them or them teaching me? Them. Okay, guys, cool. Next. So if these are hazards in your opinion, what do you think is the safe way of doing it? Mr. Muhammad, uh, we think that whenever we do the job on the machines, we need to wear the safety glasses. Um, we think we should do it also in the bigger workshop when we are out there. Uh, but, but, but Mr. Muhammad, we think we don't need to wear safety glasses in the store. Uh, there is no risk there. It's okay. It's okay. As long as you and I agree they are safe, there you go. This is the safe way of doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, what are we looking at? This is a set of policies and procedures written by who? Me or them? Them. Never happened before. Beautiful, guys. Good job. My, I have one more request from you, and it is this. I'll give each one of you a card that you will carry along the week, the whole week. This card will be with you all the time. And all you need to do, you are technicians, you have your pins with you. All you need to do is this. Whenever you remember to put on your safety glasses, give yourself a plus, put it in the plus boxes. Whenever you fail or forget to put your safety glasses, just put a minus there in the minus box. That's all, it's, all, it's just pluses and minuses, all right? and hand over the cards to me at the end of the week. And remember, no names. I don't want your names. See you next week. I'll get the cards and I'll meet you again in the same meeting. Next week, I collect the cards, do the math, just calculate the pluses against minuses to see how much compliant they were. And this is the graph I show them. Of course, I do a, a poster for them. This is their real picture. This is the fitting room team and they put the glasses so that they can see the target that they want to reach and they have already decided that they will meet 100% in three to four weeks only. And now the day comes next week, we meet. Week number one, your score is 67%. What do you think that does to them? The number shocked them, but it also shook them to move and improve because they were anxious to beat their own record. Next week, 70%. The week after, 71%. They said they will achieve in four weeks. Do you think they did? No, they didn't. They achieved ultimately in 100% in week 12. So imagine, they kept the momentum until they achieved the target. So did every other section in the uh, workshops. The other seven did the same. They had different behaviors, but all of them went with the same system and ultimately they achieved the targets. Soon we saw a department that is not being driven by the safety department, but they were self-driven to do safety. And here I want to tell you how we did it. This is the time to uncover to you the three steps shortcut. So be ready. Three safe shortcuts we've done to get this. Walk, watch, and when. First, walk. Who does the safety walk usually? It's us. We walk into the departments, we give a talk, we lecture them, and we are out. In our case, we give them the privilege of walking us through the hazards and risks and talking to us about them, and I put their data in front of them, which is made by them. A very important rule in adult learning says, people are more committed to the data that they produce and that data was produced by them and that's why we saw more commitment. The second W is watch. The second shortcut is watch. Peter Drucker says, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Same applies to safety, but it's more complex. So a famous question we have, how do you know if you're successful at safety? What measures do you follow? We have incident rates, risk assessments, and investigations, non-conformities, the whole nine yards. But how much of that do the employees understand, let alone influence? Instead, we give them a simple way to measure their progress, pluses and minuses, and lines that go up and they can beat. And that's why they had measurement and metrics that they could interpret 
influence and improve. And the last shortcut is win. Instead of we management bragging and taking credit for the things that the department do, this time we gave them the privilege of celebrating their own achievement. Each, each section that reaches the target, we allow the workforce to do the celebration on their own, to do the talk, to do the celebration the way they want. And we didn't even sponsor the cakes so that, that they will celebrate with. But if they brought homemade cakes, the management would participate anyway. And there they are, happy that they are celebrating and owning all the, the, all the things that they have done. So three shortcuts, walk, watch, and win. It didn't stop there. The ball kept rolling and we saw they, they are going beyond what the measurement that we have given them. People used to come to us and create ideas we had no idea that they would do one day. This is one of the sections who decided to conquer the bad habit of jumping over the pit of the maintenance for the trucks. And they added a sticker which they printed in the company's PR department to put it there so that the contractor laborers, who more, many of them do not understand the language, can see clearly they are not allowed to step. They are taking care of each other and they are going the extra mile. And my favorite was when the supervisors came to me and said, Mr. Muhammad, we want to participate. You, you're just supervisors. You're out of the scope. You are sitting in a comfortable place. You, you, you work less and get paid more. Mr. Muhammad, we discovered that we too do not commit. Our employees do not see us wearing safety glasses all the time and we are bad examples, please get us in. And this is the picture of all the heads and supervisors, real supervisors of those eight sections, sitting humbly in front of me, filling their cards, giving me weekly, and that's why they also achieved four weeks what supervisors we had. Ladies and gentlemen, you might ask, you might think, a uh, safety program is as good as long as it's there. The commitment exists as long as the program lasts. Let me tell you one thing. The pictures I showed you at the beginning are not from 2009. These pictures are from 2019, last year. I saw these pictures when I came across this Instagram account and I got curious. It was an account for those people in the maintenance services. I got curious. I texted the man in charge and he said, Muhammad, we still remember you. This is all because of the initiative that you led and launched back in 2009. We are still committed. How? How come a shortcut like this go a long way? Simple. It's a safe shortcut. Instead of doing so many things on their behalf, so many things for them, you can let them do. Your safe shortcut, dear leader, dear manager, dear supervisor, to reach to a safety culture is, is the three W's. Walk, watch, and when. Soon, the numbers and programs will vanish, but what will stay is the values, perceptions, beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors. And this is what matters. It's not about the program. All you need to do is just let them walk, let them watch, let them win. And I hope you will never see a Black Wednesday in your organization or for anyone who works for you. And if that is too difficult to remember, I am ready to give you another shortcut. It's right in the front of you. W, W, W. Shortcut. Dot safe. Stay safe. And back to you. Please give our judges two minutes of silence to complete their balance.
Born in Tanzania amongst the Maasai people, Altish Tobias's first occupation was that of a cattle herder. He spoke only in the Maasai language, ate beef, sometimes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and was so introverted that he could not have addressed an audience of one. He grew up believing that he was destined to marry a Maasai girl, have children and grandchildren with her, and just live a quiet pastoral life in his small village. However, after getting an education locally and abroad, Tobias discovered his own potential and the wondrous opportunities that exist for those who dare to dream and act. Today, he eats fish, speaks four languages, has traveled to 30 countries and addressed more than 50,000 people. He has worked in several countries, including the UK, Switzerland, Tunisia, Tanzania, Kenya, and South Africa. In addition to that, he is a distinguished Toastmaster, a John Maxwell certified coach, a banker, a mentor, a trainer, and a speaker. He is also a TEDx speaker and a coach. He currently lives in Pretoria, where he works for the African Development Bank. He is a son from a loving family, a brother to six siblings, an uncle to 300 nieces and nephews, a husband, and a father of three daughters. Old Test Tobias. Hello. Come out, we're going to go to Sujita. Medrinya Nabo 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 Nilama Opi. Meaning, Altesh, I've seen you dating a lot of girls. In my opinion, I don't see any of them graduating to ever becoming your wife. That conversation happened when I was about 30 years old. It was my uncle. It happened in Arusha, Tanzania. It happened at a time when two of my young brothers had already gotten married. So the clock was ticking for me. And my uncle continued. If you marry a girl from another town, expect about 5% difference in, in culture, traditions, and customs. And he continued, if you marry a girl from another country, Kenya, Ethiopia, Uganda, expect about 50% differences. However, if you marry a girl from another continent, from another race, from another ethnicity, expect a hoping 90% differences in culture, customs, and traditions. You should marry a girl from our own kind, the Maasai. When I thought about the advice of my uncle, it occurred to me that he was right. So I changed my dating tactics. I became a little bit more intentional on who I date. And I was fortunate to meet this beautiful, tall, dark-skinned Maasai girl. And I expressed my emotions to her, to which she responded, Altesh, I'm looking for someone who is tall, muscular, dark-skinned, wide shoulders, something that you can obviously see I don't have. And she continued, besides, I need someone who is strong, someone who can take care of a family, someone who can defend us if there's any problem. Altesh, can you kill a lion? I did cost-benefit analysis. And I decided to, to, to take off because the stakes were too high. But I did not stop there. Remember, the pressure was building up. After some time, I met. This girl, who was my height, my skin color, 
and we just bonded. We were lovers. And after dating for about a year, we decided to take it to the next level to get married in 1999, at around June. I started saving the money for the wedding. I was happy I shared the news with my friends, with my relatives, with everyone that I knew at that time. If I knew you at that time, I would also share the news with you. After some time, in our communities, you don't only marry a girl, it's like a communal affair. So I told this lady, her name was Namelok. Namelok, before we get married and continue with our arrangements, I need to meet your parents. To which she said, oh, Tesh, why are you in such a rush? Let it marinate a little bit. And I waited. After a few months, I went back. Namelok, I need to meet your parents. To which she responded, Altej, let it, let it simmer a bit more. And I let it simmer. When I went back the third time, she said, Altej, I'm sorry. It's not going to happen. I just got dumped. That hit me like thunderbolt. Have you ever been dumped? It's not a good feeling. I would rather you get hit by a truck than being dumped like a hot potato. I used to be cool. I lost my cool. I used to be composed like Nelson Mandela. I lost my composure. I even lost my appetite. As Maasai, we consume beef for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I lost appetite for beef. I only drank water. They say water saves life. That time, water saved my life. And after going this spiral, sleepy, sloppy drain, for months, I realized that it was time for me to look up and get up. Because if I stay too long down there, I would never come out. So the first thing that I did is, I decided to count the money that I had saved for the wedding. I had about 20 million Tanzanian shillings, equivalent to around $10,000. I decided to leave the country went to UK to do my master's. So after a few weeks of attending the university, I realized that the money I had would not see me through the two year still that I was to stay in the UK. So I started to look for a job. After school, I went from office to office, door to door, street to street, looking for a job that will help me sustain my stay in the UK. After four months, I still had no job. And one day my friend asked me, but Altesh, well, what, what kind of a job are you looking for? And I told him, back home I used to work for a bank. I want to work for a bank or an insurance company, or maybe a real estate company, something that is similar to what I did home, and he said, oh, says that is not going to happen. As a student, the only jobs that are available for you is cleaning, security, waiting tables in bars and restaurants, or maybe stocking up shelves in supermarkets. Really? And he said, yes. I took his advice. After three days, I was called for an interview. It was 31st of October, 1998. After the interview, on my way back, I had to change trains at a train station known as Leytonstone in London. But when I got out of the station, it was windy, it was rainy, and it was chilly. And as I was cuddling there, thinking about the beautiful weather back home, 
my thoughts were interrupted by a noise, a noise that you hear when someone is tapping the table. And when I look back, I saw this beautiful, gorgeous, well-groomed young lady pulling her luggage trolley across the tiles. She came and stood right next to me. She looked at me and I looked at her and she smiled. She exposed these crystal white teeth. That smile, if your room was dark, you wouldn't need electricity. It was just so bright. And in this melodic, soft voice, she asked, excuse me, do you know where 65 Asheville Road is? And they look at this piece of paper. And they say, of course I do. I had no clue. And I pick her luggage and we started off to 65 as we dropped. But on the way I asked, so what is your name? And she says, my name is Sandra. And where are you from? And she says, I'm from Switzerland. And I say, and how long are you here for? And she says, I'm here for three months. And when she said three months, I said, yes, because three is my lucky number. That was 31st of October, and I was born on the 3rd. And I continued, so Sandra, in your family, how many are you? And she said, we are three. And out of the three, where do you stand in the birth order? And she said, I'm the third one. And I said, yes, this is Christmas coming early. So we continued. After three hours, we found 65 Asheville Road. And I left her there and I went home. But after two days, two things occurred to me. The first thing is this question. How was it possible for this man, this African from a small village in Arusha to be asked for directions by a white lady from Europe? For me, that was a big deal. I would include that in my CV. But the second thing that happened is, I could not just keep this girl out of my mind. Her image kept replaying in my mind like a TV commercial. Come Saturday, I was finished, I was done. I decided to show up at her door. And when I knocked, she opened the door. And she said, hi, and I said, hi. And she asked, so why are you here? And I said, I was seeing a friend down the road. And on my way back, I thought I need to just see how you're doing. I'm doing fine, so how can I help you? Then I asked myself, what do I say? What would you have said? Then. I said, would you mind if you're free one of these days to join me for a drink? And she looked at me and there was pin drop silence. And my heart was beating. She said, yes, I was happy. Before I knew we were dead. After three months, it was time for Sandra to go back. I was sad. However, her telephone bill explained what was going on. But the moment she went back, she broke the news to her parents, sharing that dad. Mom, I have found the love of my life. Love of your life in three months? Yes. And this man, where is he from? 
And what does he do? And she says, he's a student. As students, we have always told you to get married, to, to date someone who has prospects, someone who is rich, and now you have fallen for a student. And she said, yes, I love him. The interrogation continued. So this student, where is he from? He's from Africa. Africa? Which part of Africa? And she said, he is from Tanzania. And which community does he belong to? And she said, he's Maasai. Maasai? You mean the guys who don't put on trousers? And she said, yes. There was a lot of tension in their house. However, we continued dating. Mid year 2000, it was time for me to go back to Tanzania. And I also shared the news with my folks. The first question was, of Hesh, a white girl? And I said, yes. Can she milk the cows? And I said, no. Does she speak the language? I said, no. I could see the signs. I could read the signs on my parents' faces. We still continue that. In 2001, I decided to go to Switzerland. Sandra had arranged for a job attachment for both paper. And when we got there, when I got there, I expected that it was time for us to take our relationship to the next level. Maybe start planning for our wedding. But we had a completely different experience. We argued, there was a lot of stress, there was a lot of burnout. We argued on everything, even where a spoon and a fork would sit on a table. We argued to the extent that after three months, I knew that I was done. In fact, I remembered about my uncle saying, oh, there's 90% differences, 10% of the chance of your marriage surviving. It was time for me to go back to Tanzania. And at the airport, just before starting the check-in procedure, I made a decision that it is time for me to go back and just kill a liar, look for a Maasai girl. But something happened. We agreed. I don't know where that came from, but we agreed that Sanda would come to Tanzania and we give it our last and final shot. She came back after about three weeks. She landed at the Kilimanjaro International Airport. My two young brothers and I were waiting. I couldn't wait to hug Sandra. We quickly loaded her stuff into the car. We started off our journey to Arusha. We were aboard a Peugeot 504, a 1974 model, quite an old car. And I remember this car had a broken exhaust pipe, which kept emitting heat right in the back seat where Sandra and I were sitting. And I remember Sandra saying, Oltej, is this car burning? And I said, no, that is our heating system. On the way, I was still not sure how my parents were going to react. I did not have a major problem with my mother because we were good friends, just like all the mothers in the house today. But my dad was a little bit tricky. I didn't know how he was going to react to meeting, when meeting Sandra. But when we got home after greetings, the next thing I see is Sandra and my dad were sitting at the front porch smoking. And I remember my dad saying, these cigarettes from Europe are very light. I know cigarettes kill. But for me, cigarettes saved my relationship. Sandra and my dad became smoking buddies. The next trip was to visit my grandmother. And when we got there, she offered to prepare tea for, for us. And she had this small kitchen. She had that tea pot on, a, on three stones. And she used firewood to cook. And Sandra could not stand seeing this 90 year 
old lady preparing tea. So she offered to poke the firewood, and I remember tears were streaming down her cheeks, and she was <coughs> coughing from the, the smoke. And my grandmother looked at her and looked at me, and she said, More will I imagine Meaning, son, this is the girl you should marry. We got married after two years. The girl that I met at the train station has been with me for more than 20 years. I would like to tell you this evening that the 10% that my uncle was talking about, if you remember the 10%, is what we used to build our marriage and this beautiful family. The 10% that my uncle was talking about is what we used to address the differences that we had. Sandra had to learn Kiswahili, I had to learn French. Sandra had to learn how to cook the traditional African dishes. I had to learn how to eat cheese and how to stew. The 10% that my uncle was talking about is what we used to demonstrate that it is possible to address our differences. As you listen to me, I would like to say this. If there is a dream that you have, if there is something that you want to achieve in life, and all you have got is 10%, go for it. Make use of it. Make the best out of it to cover the 90% of the resources that you don't have. Please give our judges two minutes of silence so that they may complete their ballots. I would like to present each candidate with a certificate of participation at this year's 2020 Accredited Speaker Program. Forrest Tuff. Dr. Kevin Snyder. Mohammed Shipley. Old Test Tobias. Thank you to each of our accomplished candidates for sharing your expertise with us today. It was a pleasure to see you present. I also want to thank accredited speaker program council chairs and chief judges 
past international president and accredited speaker, Dilip Abasekara, and accredited speaker, Robert Cavallo, for your commitment to this program. And thank you all for joining us to hear these phenomenal speakers today. As a reminder, the results of the 2020 Accredited Speaker Program will be announced during the World Championship of Public Speaking event taking place tomorrow, August 29th at 2 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If you would like more information about the Accredited Speaker Program, please visit toastmasters.org slash membership slash accredited speaker. Thank you.